Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Twin Tiers EPC. We uh, are very thankful to be here to worship the Lord our Savior. We do have a few announcements uh, before the service starts. There's a newsletter in the back with important dates for January through the end of March. If you haven't picked one up yet, please do so. But there is a correction that needs to be made on the newsletter. Uh, Brandon, Heather, and I will be attending the ordination service for the new pastor at Silver Lake next week. So Joe will be preaching next week instead of the end of the month. And we'll be postponing communion until the second Sunday. Don't forget to practice the three circles we discussed last week. This week is Community Kitchen at 9 a.m. on Friday. If you haven't volunteered before and are available, I'd encourage you to get with Noel to see what's involved. We do have three Bible studies each week, Tuesday at the Monroe's and two on Thursday here at the church for men and women. Uh, no, no Bible study at Butch's this week? Oh, Wednesday night for just this week. Gotcha. <coughs> There is normally Sunday school after church. We're not having it today because we finished the three circles uh, training last week. We are considering uh, some different uh, programs such as video series, uh, so stay tuned on that. We do encourage everyone to stay and learn more about God um, as we go through these um, Bible studies uh, during Sunday school. Ash Wednesday is coming up. On February 14th, we'll be having a service at 7 p.m. And then, uh, do the, the Bobs want to talk about yesterday, or do you want me to do it? <laughs> All right. Yes. Yes. Uh oh. We have to grow. Uh, it was a very successful men's breakfast yesterday. Uh, we had good food, good fellowship, uh, good participation by everyone. Um, there was no lack of hands uh, to help serve. Uh, either to, to cook or clean after. Um, we do need to invite more people. I'm guilty of that uh, as well. I, I came alone. I should have brought somebody. So um, the women at their tea had 18 last time. We had 13 uh, men. So we've got some growing to do to catch up. Yes, we want to pass. So. That is all of the announcements uh, that I have. Yep, mention that. All right, let's quiet our hearts and mind as we turn our focus on Jesus, the only reason we're here.
Today's call to worship comes from First Chronicles, uh, kind of a collection of verses. Uh, starts at chapter 16, verse 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Praise be to the Lord, the God, from everlasting to everlasting. Worship team. This is a 
amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Now's the time for prayer. Is there anybody that wants to start us off? Joys or concerns? Bob? I want to praise everybody for, thank everybody for praying for us while we were gone. Uh, we had a good trip back. We finally got it figured out where we want to go 400 miles a day, and that works out very well for us. And so that worked out very time, and uh, we've got a lot done for her, even though it rained and everything else, but we still got a lot done for our daughter. So I do want to thank everybody that prayed, especially the people that prayed for me when I was sick down there. I caught a cold, and I couldn't get rid of it for a little while, but I did get rid of it. And I do thank you for everything. And yesterday, it was, it was amazing, yes, with the guys. So we'll have to do it again. Um, we do have an unspoken request, and we need help for Community Kitchen on Friday, too. Okay. I want to praise the Lord that Sarah Jane is safely back in Toga. And, and for my friend, missionary Ann Dieselberg in Thailand, that 
They found housing for two trafficked women that are they're finding ways back to the their home countries. These are internationally trafficked. They're looking for housing for safe housing for three more. And we're asking prayer for our oldest son Tim, who's kind of under the weather with trying to keep his oxygen levels up. They're passing uh, severe colds around. There's only eight or nine of them living in one house. There's four generations all living together. So we're asking prayer for him. Tim. Tim. I have a praise report. Uh, my great nephew is coming home February 1st, and he told me to tell you all thank you so much for praying for him. We went over to my sister's yesterday, went out for dinner last night, and the waiter that we had uh, is married. His wife is in the Philippines. He's been having all kinds of trouble bringing her into this country legally. Well, he has to get his and so he's got to fly back in uh, three months, hypothetically, to meet all the rules and regulations and bring her back. He's just hoping that he doesn't have issues with that as well. So I told him that we would pray for him. So his name is Neil. Uh, and his wife is patiently waiting for him in the Philippines. The Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. And let's pray for our nation. Uh, severely needed at this time. Let's thank the Lord for those in service to us, whether it's in the military, police, firemen, EMT workers, hospital workers, teachers, snowplow drivers, all those in service to us, let's pray for them. Thank the Lord for their service. We should remember uh, the prayers from the moods. Uh, they are uh, diligent of making sure they're on the prayer chain. Uh, but her youngest daughter is returning to work uh, tomorrow in the schools, and so uh, she needs uh, prayers. You know, beginning to get back to a uh, work family life balance, you know, especially with the, the new baby, um, getting back to some sort of normalcy. Um, also, pray for their um, <coughs> health. They have been under the weather a bit with uh, colds and, and such. So, and uh, praises that their daughter wasn't injured, uh, Melanie in Gettysburg, um, when there was an incident with a car and a deer. So. We have a praise. We had a roof leak, and the person who put the roof on came and put at least a temporary fix on it, so it's right over my bed, so I'm not getting wet. So <laughs> I told Bob I'd switch sides with him. <laughs> anyway, um, and then we have a couple prayer requests. Our son Chris is getting his foot operated on on Wednesday, and our son-in-law Eric is having some uh, health difficulties, and they can't seem to figure out what they are, so we need to figure that, they need to figure that out, and get them on the right path. So, you know, we did have a successful men's breakfast uh, yesterday, and we had two extra extras, if you will, out of 13. There was two, one that built the, the ramp, and uh, he was able to come back with David. Uh, he's been with us a few times. And, and Cl Cliffy, um, the Sterling's uh, friend. Uh, it's a nephew, is it? And, uh, cousin. Cousin, okay. Yeah. And uh, so we found out that uh, somebody had stepped off into the uh, children's nursery uh, and put a, a, <laughs> a hole in it. But uh, Cliffy is an accomplished uh, builder, you know, a technician, and I asked him if he would help, and he will. So that's, uh, I, would say, I suppose that's a good thing to have him come along, and, and we prayed with him. Um, we had the Triple Bob show yesterday that was amazing. Uh, 
Um, and um, the, today, so the Lord reigns. Uh, today's the Sabbath, and uh, we're supposed to keep it holy. And uh, so we are going to do that. Um, we are grateful and praise God for our work, our pensions, hospitals, military, police. Uh, those We pray for those unchurched, the sick, the poor, the hungry, the homeless, um, the victimized. We are grateful for the farmers, the truckers, uh, UPS, USPS, the FedEx. Our, I think our uh, postage is going up four cents, I think, right now. I think I heard that yesterday. So be ready for that. Um, I was reading in, uh, in the uh, devotion that um, peace be upon Israel. It's in Isaiah. It's right out of Scripture. Let it be, Lord. Pray for the persecuted church. Uh, the, um, voice, the voice of the martyrs is, is uh, shocking. At the same time, uh, there's some trouble in, uh, all over the world. And pray for those missionaries and Sarah Jane and uh, those in Goma and, and Togo, China. Uh, pray for our government. Our government's a state, federal, and local government, those that are in, in power there. Um, pray for our witness that we... Uh, uh, someone asked me yesterday, there's a sticker on my car that says, Pray for America. And he said something like, there's, we got to do more than that. We got to do is pray for America more than just pray. And I said, oh, I said, that, that's enough. But I know that it's not enough. We have to do work. We have to, to be God's hands and feet. Um, and he was right. And, um, but yeah. So um, pray for schools. And uh, we are grateful for our friends and family. And, um, uh, we pray for those victims of violence. Uh, we are grateful for the stores that we go to to buy our their needs and uh, the grocers and the grow the growers. Grateful for them, and uh, praise God for them. So, um, yeah, uh, it's in it's in God's hands. Um, pray for. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Cliff. Cliff. As my cousin, he comes from a, a very difficult past. He's been in foster care, and he has um, cerebral palsy. But he continues to work, and he's a very nice young man that's polite and tries to help everybody. But be in prayer for him. He, he just calls us, Bob, God bless Bob. He talks to him every night. Cliff gets depressed. He he just sits and cries. He's alone, um, but he's a good, really good kid, and he he wants to help others. So just pray for Cliff. We don't see Barb or Greg here today. I hope they're not under the weather too. I got to keep them in prayer also. I'm not going to repeat all of these, but know that God has heard all of these prayers. And like Chris mentioned, I think last week, when we can, we're going to uh, encourage people to get these on the prayer list as well, so that either people that aren't here or it just is a great way to reference back throughout the week uh, to pray for things. So, all right, well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for how you care for us. You know, in your word, you even tell us to cast our cares on you. Um, you want us to bring these things to you. Uh, and we thank you for this time that we have to share uh, in, in this group here today so that we can show our love to each other. But we know that it's you that control all things. We know that you can intervene on all these things. So we do. We offer these up to you, asking you to, to work through them as you see fit. We do ask you for comfort and peace to rest on those who are struggling, maybe have experienced loss recently, uh, who 
who struggle with depression or anxiety. We pray that you would just give them your spirit of comfort and peace, bring people alongside them that can help support them and, and uh, share that message of peace with them. As always, we have a lot in our family here, our, our congregation, our extended church family that are struggling with medical or health issues, and we do pray that you would uh, be present in those. We know you use doctors and medicine to help care for these needs, and we just pray that you would work through uh, and just make yourself visible and present to those who are struggling through these health concerns. We pray for your support and protection on those you've called into the mission field. We know that many of them are in locations where sharing your gospel is being done under threats of harm, and we pray that you would just put your protection on them, uh, help us to support them as we can financially, uh, with prayer, but we know that you can also um, support them and protect them where they're at so that your message can get out. Pray for those who are lonely or isolated. Pray for those that are in hospitals, nursing homes, uh, jails, people who may be uh, homebound. We just pray that you would um, bring support through others who can give them companionship and just make sure that they are taken care of and they are loved. We think of all these other things that have been brought up today. We offer them up to you. We ask that you would work through them according to your will. As we close this time of prayer, we use the words that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as the worship team comes back up to sing the doxology in another song, uh, let's just offer up a prayer for the uh, offering. We have multiple ways of giving, and we thank this congregation who has always been very consistent and generous with your giving. So let's pray now. Lord, we thank you for blessing us with skills and abilities, for providing us with the resources for our tangible needs. Now as we offer back to you just this small portion of what you've given us, we ask that you would multiply them, guide us in where and how to use them for the effective growth of your kingdom. Amen.
Before we move into the first scripture, let's offer for prayer of illumination. Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's first scripture comes from John chapter 4. Uh, kind of jump and skip a couple spots just so it doesn't get super long. But we'll start with verses 5 through 15 and then drop down to 25. Starting in verse 5, So he, Jesus, came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? 
Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Down to 25. <clears throat> The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. This is the word of the Lord. So <clears throat> the last few weeks, we've been talking about the three circles, and even more generally, we've just been talking about ways that we can be equipped and prepared to evangelize when opportunities present themselves. I think it's plain to see that God puts each of us in different situations or environments, and the way to best share or show or share the gospel or model his love is going to be different for each of those It was mentioned last week that there are some in our church who are great at striking up a conversation with a random stranger in the grocery store, the post office, wherever it might be. Conversation that might lead to sharing the gospel or at least being willing to help carry the other person's burdens by offering to pray for them. This, I'm sure, leaves an impression on that person, that other person, and is clearly an example of evangelizing. I agree with a lot of the others what they had to say last week's discussion, that engaging in random strangers in conversation at the grocery store, at the post office, wherever you might be, doesn't come naturally to a lot of us. It certainly doesn't come naturally to me. Now I'll admit, I may be more outgoing than many, and I might even make light conversation to strangers, but within a very tight context. If I see that they're wearing an Eagles jersey or an Eagles hat, and we just had a big win the day before, I might strike up a conversation with them and say, hey, how was that win, you know? But doing the same thing to try to share the gospel is a whole lot different to me. So the question becomes, how can we all be obedient to God's directive that we share the gospel with others? Well, I think there's a lot of other people out there who probably won't be reachable by that casual conversation in the grocery store. That works in some cases, but it won't always work. I believe we need to be sensitive to the relevance or the context of our precise circumstances and environment. A big part of our gospel reach does come from our actions. At the risk of sounding like I'm just making an excuse for lacking boldness, I believe there is scriptural evidence too that there is a big part of our testimony that is played out in how we act how we talk, how we treat others, even just our general demeanor. I think we can all agree that in these current times, there's an awful lot of criticism and judgment, a lot of scrutinizing people's lives, and as it relates to this message, Christians in particular, pointing out times that we screw up or are acting in a way that does not glorify God (coughs) as much as we might be striving for. One of Benjamin Franklin's famous sayings is that it takes many good deeds to build a good reputation and only one bad one to lose it. We live in a time and a place where many have been hurt by religion or the church, somehow feel unseen or unimportant to this God we talk about. Or maybe, I know I've come across a lot of people who grew up in the church. They were churched in their upbringing, but their, their experience was one more of oppressive or aggressive or controlling a negative environment 
where rather than nourishing a healthy spiritual walk that brought them closer to Christ, their experience only reinforced their desire to distance themselves from the church or organized religion. I think we're all old enough to remember some of the fire and brimstone or other pretty aggressive, you're going to hell types of sermons or messages, along with a lot of very rigid and what not to do teachings with what feels like little to no attention given to the joy and freedom a true relationship with Christ can bring. I think we can safely agree that this approach will not attract those people, but in a lot of cases will actually probably further cement their distrust and discomfort with Christianity or those Christians. So to kind of continue this line of thought a little bit, I want to jump back and take a minute to consider something that Chris mentioned, I think it was two weeks ago in his message. During the message, he posed a question. He said, when people look at us, what do they see? And then he kind of went on a little bit, and a few minutes later, he said that people will see something different and will want what we have. Now, I don't want to disagree with you, Chris, or contradict what you said, but I think we might need to make just a little correction or adjustment to that to say that people will hopefully see something different, and hopefully that something different that they see is a reflection of God in us. And as we continue to refine us, as he continues to refine us on our faith journey, and then they will want what we have. But like I said earlier, people are watching and will be quick to point out the times we fall short or even perhaps sin. I think (coughs) the other popular saying is there's no news like bad news. I think people are very quick to point out the negative, but we need to be aware of how we're acting and hopefully, as much as we can, have a positive uh, impression out there. So our actions and our outward behavior, our attitude and demeanor, affect what people see in us, and right or wrong are elements that they use to build an opinion or an impression about us. Are we being intentional, proactive, and continually aware of how we are presenting ourselves? Jesus, during his time on earth as a man... I think is obviously a great model and example for how we should act. That first scripture that we just read, (coughs) when he met the woman at the well, I kind of skipped over a little bit in there, but the part that we didn't read, um, well, we can see from what we did read, he was very calm, very kind. He was relational. He actually interacted with her and kind of built, even just briefly, a relationship with her. The parts that we skipped over is where he talks about the fact that she, he tells her to go get his, her husband. And she says, I have no husband. And, he's, and that's when Jesus said, that's right. The man you're with is not your husband, and you've been with four other husbands. So he actually pointed out the sin that she had in her life. And even though he pointed that out, it still brought her to a place where she wanted what he had. Now, Just as Jesus is the best example for how we should act, I'm not suggesting that we present present ourselves as better or special or somehow of greater importance than the ones we're surrounded by. Matthew 6, starting in at verse 1, I'm sure we've all heard this scripture before, but this says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may be giving in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Here, Jesus is referring to the Pharisees and other religious elites. Their haughty, arrogant, better-than-thou attitudes and actions are being explicitly identified as a wrong approach. Here's another example, and one that might seem a bit more unusual, but I still think it 
I think it kind of still fits here, and I think kind of lays out how our actions are perceived by others. If we jump back to the Old Testament, I don't remember, I don't think this one was in the... Yeah, oh, it is. Genesis 37. Yeah, starting in at verse 3, this is the story of Joseph. Uh, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now I know we're not going to read the whole story of Joseph. It would take the rest of the morning. But Joseph was very much used by God, obviously, that he his entire journey he became Pharaoh's second in command. He saved the nation from starvation because he was able to warn of and prepare for the famine that was coming. All of that was orchestrated by God. And I also know that Joseph's story is not of him trying to evangelize to his brothers. But I am still trying to illustrate that our actions and behavior impact those around us. Can we see that his brother, or Joseph, the way he told his brother his dreams? I don't know. I mean, I have brothers. We were teenagers once, but I, I still have to kind of question myself, ask just, what was he hoping to get out of that? He's telling his brothers that eventually you're going to bow down to me. And so I think just to recognize that how we, what we say, how we say it, and how we act is perceived by others in many different ways. lost my spot. Now if we return back to the example of Jesus in the New Testament, we can consider yet another interaction, this one in Luke chapter 23, uh, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. This is when they're on the cross during the crucifixion. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our de deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. <clears throat> now I haven't studied this in depth, but I'm going to guess that those two criminals, in order to have come to the point where they're being put on a cross, have probably been in jail for a little while, leading up to the crucifixion. Yet this one criminal had heard enough about Jesus and his reputation to know that he was being killed unjustly, and he believed in the final moments of his life, no long conversion story, no big testimony, but a simple confession that Jesus confirmed, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus' actions and behavior leading up to that moment was widespread enough to have reached this criminal in jail who was sentenced to death. People are watching and will share with others how we behave and how we act. So we know by Jesus' example that we need to act, and we need to act in a way that glorifies God. So let's consider this popular passage from James, chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 8 and going through 17. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, 
you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you don't commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother and sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And then if we jump forward to just James 2, 26, that same chapter, makes me think it might be important because Jesus repeats it, as the body without spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. I think this passage is the perfect segue to the next point I wanted to make today, and I believe will help us have the most impact in any evangelistic effort we make. That point is whatever we do must be done from a position of love. 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 11, we all know this one too. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And then jumping just a little further ahead in 1 John chapter 4, starting at the second part of verse 16 through 21, kind of continues the same thread. It says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So the mandate is clear, we must love because God loved us. We didn't choose to love God first, we didn't have to do all sorts of things to get right with God before he loved us. No, nope. while we are still sinners, God loved us. In our actions, we need to ask God to continually refine us so we can reflect his love. I think an interesting takeaway of the examples of Jesus is that the interactions, like I mentioned earlier, are relational. Many of these are conversational, a back and forth, but not a talking at or talking down to. Even though he had all the reason to be able to do that, he was perfect, and yet it was a talking with and not a talking at or talking down to. People, especially in our culture, current culture and environment, will be far more receptive to hear anything we have to say if it is free of confrontation and judgment. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a great theologian of earlier in the 19, uh, 1900s, I was going to say 19th century, uh, he said, judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace with which others are just as entitled as we are. If we approach these interactions with humility and admit that we, Christians or people of the church, that we are all sinners, none of us are greater than any others. We are simply benefactors of the same gift that's been given freely to all of us. Thinking of 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, uh, that says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. 
We need to remember that as we share the truth, we need to do so in a spirit of love. So, wrapping up, we need to be mindful of our every interaction, how we act, how we behave, how we speak, even when we don't think anybody's watching. We need to look for simple ways we can show kindness and reflect God's love, which was undeserved. This may be a conversation in the grocery store like some of us are good at. This might be extending some other common courtesy. Um, Might be letting them get into line ahead of you. Even when you know that they're budging, they know that they're budging, they know that you know that they're budging. It might just be something as simple as that. Maybe it's holding the door for someone. Maybe it's letting go of that road rage, even when it feels like it's well-deserved. Might be helping to pay for somebody else's groceries. We don't know. I think what's important here is to be sensitive to the convictions that Christ gives us and being obedient to act on them. Might only take the smallest, most insignificant act or word of kindness to provide an opening for more conversation. Maybe no further interaction takes place, but maybe it leaves that person thinking what Chris mentioned a few weeks ago. I see something different in that person, and I want what they have. God will direct the rest. If we're obedient, he will take care of that. Maybe he'll make it so you have an opportunity to share more, or maybe it just primes that person to be open to hear the gospel from the next person that God puts in their path. The simple point is you were obedient in your part. So let's remember that others are always watching. Let us strive to be a reflection of the God we serve who has offered a gift to anyone who chooses to accept it. May we all do, may all we do come from a place of humble service, not haughty superiority. For all we are, for all, for we are all in need of God's grace. So as I close today, I want to read an entry from this Valley of Visions. Uh, It's a a collection of Puritan prayers and devotions. I know I've read from this before. Uh, You'll have to kind of forgive me a little bit. It's written in like an old English, kind of a King Jamesy style. But so it's a little hard to understand sometimes, but I think the context of what this one entry is, I think is uh, kind of fitting for today. The title of this one is called Things Needful. Thou eternal source, author of all created beings and happiness, I adore thee for making man capable of religion, that he may be taught to say, Where is God, my maker, who giveth songs in the night? But degeneracy has spread over our human race, turning glory into shame, rendering us forgetful of thee. We know it is thy power alone that can recall wandering children, can impress on them a sense of divine things, and can render that sense lasting and effectual. From thee proceed all good purposes and desires, and the diffusing of piety and happiness. Thou hast knowledge of my soul's secret principles, and are aware of my desires to spread the gospel. Make me an almoner to give thy bounties to the indigent, comfort to the mentally ill, restoration to the sin-deceased, hope to the despairing, joy to the sorrowing, love to the prodigals. Blow away the ashes of unbelief by thy spirit's breath, and give me light, fire, and warmth of love. I need spiritual comforts that are gentle, peaceful, mild, refreshing, that will melt me into conscious lowliness before thee, that will make me feel and rest in thee as my all. Fill the garden of my soul with the wind of love, that the sense of the Christian life may be wafted to others. Then come and gather fruits to thy glory, so shall I fulfill the great end of my being to glorify thee and be a blessing to men. Amen. Worship team. Thank you.
as we share today's benediction, <clears throat> let's remember that as long as we're obedient to what God is calling each of us to do, whatever our part is, He will support us and equip us. With that said, here is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.